Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry that uh, we can't all meet physically together, but at least we can uh, have a uh, meeting of minds. So Katevi proposed that uh, I start off by just giving a, a brief personal introduction. So uh, as I say here, my name is John Ellis. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I've always been interested not in pure abstract theory, but in making predictions for experiments and interpreting their results. So uh, my background is mainly in particle physics, but I work also in cosmology and high energy astrophysics, and I'll be coming back to some of those themes later in my talk. Uh, so for many years, I worked at CERN. Uh, now I'm a professor at King's College London. Uh, so one of my interests outside pure research is to uh, enhance global participation in research. And uh, that's one reason why I've been associated with the African School of Physics now for a decade. So I, I said that uh, for many years uh, I was at CERN and uh, while I was there, uh, as you can see here, my office accumulated a lot of papers. Uh, I've often been asked whether I could find anything that I wanted. My answer always was, well, I could find what I really needed. Anyway, uh, as I mentioned, I left uh, the employ of uh, CERN in uh, 2011, and uh, now I work for King's College London. Uh, so uh, here is a view from our seminar room at King's, uh, looking up the River Thames, towards the Houses of Parliament on the right-hand side. Uh, of course, I, I'm not at King's at the moment. Everybody is in lockdown and I actually happen to be uh, in my house uh, near CERN. So as I mentioned, I've been uh, associated with uh, the African School of Physics since the beginning. And uh, here is a, a picture that I found of the first one that we held in uh, 2010. Uh, I don't think it's going to be too difficult for you to uh, pick me out from the crowd there. So uh, Katevi and I, all of us are very sad that we're not organizing a physical school in Morocco this year, but we hope to be organizing a physical school very soon. So uh, the title for my talk today is uh, taken from this painting by uh, Gauguin. So there's a bunch of people here who are asking uh, very fundamental questions about uh, humankind and our place in the universe. What are we? Where do we come from? Uh, where are we going? So you know, people can look at this from uh, various different points of view. Many people will ask these questions with a very metaphysical frame of mind. But uh, I ask these questions from the point of view of a particle physicist and uh, I would say actually that the aim of particle physics is precisely to address these three Gauguin questions. And if you want to distill those questions down to one, what is the matter in the universe made of? So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, in this lecture. So uh, I mentioned the universe. Uh, what do we know about the universe? So I think that uh, Sally Seidel has already given you some introduction to this, but let me just remind you that uh, the universe started about 13.8 billion years ago. It's now about 10 to the 28 centimeters across the piece that we can see, and it's expanding. Uh, it's been expanding from uh, the Big Bang uh, over there on the left-hand side. So what are we becomes the question, what is the universe made of? Uh, those stars and all the other features that we see in the sky. Uh, where do we come from? Comes back, to, back to the question, what happened at or close to the Big Bang? And uh, where are we going? Uh, what will happen to the universe in the future? Will it continue its expansion? Will it reverse? What's going to happen? So, uh, let me rephrase Gauguin's questions in the language of particle physics. So what are we? What is matter made of? And as we're going to discuss in a moment, a key aspect of that question is why do things weigh? Uh, we all have, we think, too much weight. 
uh, that weight is made up out of the masses of individual particles, uh, why do particles weigh? Where do those particles come from? What is the origin of the matter in the universe? And uh, as I'll discuss in more detail in a moment, uh, astronomers tell us that in addition to the physical matter out of which we're made, there's also invisible dark matter filling the universe. In fact, there's much more dark matter than there is visible matter. What is it? Uh, how does the universe evolve? Well, uh, Einstein gave us some equations to describe that, but in order to understand the details, we have to know what are the constituents in the universe, what are the fundamental particles. Uh, and maybe they'll tell us how the universe got to be so big and old, and maybe they'll tell us what the future of the universe is going to be like. So anyway, our, our job as physicists is to ask these questions and hopefully at least provide some of the answers. So one of the answers has been provided by this guy whom you see here. This gentleman is Peter Higgs. Uh, you had already heard a little bit about him and his boson from uh, Sally's talk, and I'll return to that in my talk. But these other issues, these require physics beyond what we know at the moment. And uh, that's why we physicists are looking for additional physics beyond what has been shown by the experiment so far. So one of our major tools for that is the Large Hadron Collider, LHC at CERN. So uh, Katevi is uh, one of the people working on experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. And I'll describe what it is that those experiments are currently trying to do. So here I've got a logarithmic ruler which describes many of the important scales in the universe, all the way from its total size in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, 10 to the 28 centimeters. Uh, for example, the distance between the Earth and the Sun and the radius of the Earth here in the middle. Then towards the left, we have the sizes of atoms and protons. And far left, we have the scale of the universe at the beginning of the Big Bang. And the human scale, represented here by Albert Einstein and his kid sister when they're about a meter tall, about halfway along we have the human scale. So uh, Gauguin's first question, what are we made of? So we know we're made of uh, molecules, those molecules contain atoms, those atoms contain clouds of electrons surrounding nuclei. The nuclei are made up out of things called protons and neutrons. And we know that those protons and neutrons are made of still smaller things called quarks. So as far as we know, the most fundamental constituents of matter are quarks, electrons, and their relatives. But astronomers, when they look at the large scale structures in the universe, tell us that there must be additional invisible stuff, the so-called dark matter, which I'll return to later on in the talk. Now, what we do at CERN, what we do with the Large Hadron Collider, is well, you can think of it as being a super microscope looking deep inside the structure of the atom, the proton, and so on. But at the same time, it can reveal processes that occurred in the very early universe and maybe tell us how the universe got to be the way it is today. So our current knowledge of cosmology suggests that, as I already mentioned, there was this big bang about 13.8 billion years ago. It was about 300,000 years after that, that atoms were formed. Before that, there were no atoms, there were just nuclei, electrons and photons. In fact, nuclei themselves were not formed until about three minutes after the Big Bang. Those nuclei, as I already mentioned, are made of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons did not exist until the universe was about one microsecond old. And if you go back to one picosecond after the Big Bang, that's when we think that the masses of elementary particles appeared. And somewhere between one picosecond and one microsecond after the Big Bang, that may be when the dark matter appeared. 
And these are all things that we can probe in our experiments at the LHC. So I've been talking already about the connections between particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. It's worth remembering that particle physics largely started with cosmic rays, which were discovered about a century ago. So cosmic ray are energetic particles that hit the upper atmosphere. They produce many different types of particles. And many of the discoveries in particle physics in the first half of the last century were made by looking at those cosmic rays. But around the middle of the last century, physicists realized that if they wanted to study these particles in detail, they'd have to study them under controlled conditions in the laboratory using particle accelerators to mimic cosmic rays. And that gave rise, for example, to CERN and eventually to the Large Hadron Collider. So what have those experiments shown? So they've established something we call the standard model of particle physics, which was already being described to you a bit by Sally. Well, this is a theory that was proposed in the late 1960s by Abdus Salam, whom you see here, originally from Pakistan, and two American theorists, Glashow and Weinberg. The first evidence for their theory came uh, in the 1970s from experiments at CERN, and subsequent experiments at CERN and elsewhere provided really detailed checks on the standard model theory. So what is the standard model? So it contains particles of matter. So on the left here, you see quarks. So there's six of them, we now know. And on the right, you see also the electron and a couple of related particles called the muon and the tau. The muon was discovered in cosmic rays, the tau using particle accelerators. And in between, we have neutrinos. So these are the fundamental constituents of matter. Then between these particles, we know about four fundamental forces. So there's gravitation, electromagnetism, and then at the particle or nuclear scale, there's a strong nuclear force that holds nuclei together, and there's a weak nuclear force that causes forms of radioactivity. And I, I can't resist mentioning that electricity and magnetism were unified into the theory of electromagnetism by uh, Clark Maxwell when he was a professor at King's College London about 150 years ago. So what you see on this screen, these are the fundamental constituents of matter. That's the cosmic DNA that enables you to, uh, where you rearrange the pieces, construct stars, planets, and people. Well, th there is however one thing which is missing. Where do the particle masses come from? This is important because for example, if, if the electron did not have a mass, then it would always travel at the speed of light and it would never bind to nuclei to form atoms. So we couldn't exist. If the quarks didn't have masses, nuclei would not be so heavy. If the W particle at the bottom of the screen did not have a large mass, the weak force of radioactivity would not be weak at all and life would be impossible. So it's important to understand where particle masses come from and hence why do things weigh. So Newton of course told us that weight is proportional to mass. Einstein told us that E is equal to mc squared, but neither of them explained where the particle masses come from. And the answer was provided by this guy here, whom you've already seen once, this is Peter Higgs. Uh, and on the blackboard behind him, you can see his theory. And if I stand up a bit, you can see his theory on my t-shirt. So I'm not going to go through the details of the theory in this talk, but I wanted to emphasize that according to his theory, there should be a particle that I didn't show on the previous slide, a particle that we call the Higgs boson. And I can't resist mentioning that Peter Higgs was a student at King's College London. So what is the Higgs idea? 
So I'd like to propose to you an analogy for trying to understand how this Higgs idea works. So you should think of the Higgs theory as providing an environment, what we call a field extending throughout space. You've heard of electromagnetic and gravitational fields. Think of the Higgs field, okay? The difference with the Higgs field is that it is constant, uniform, homogeneous, and isotropic throughout all space. So let me propose to you an analogy. Imagine that you're in the middle of Siberia in the middle of winter, and you've got this universal snow field extending throughout all space, a universal medium. Now imagine trying to cross Siberia. So if you're lucky, you've got skis, you skim across the top of the snow very fast, you don't interact really with the snow. That's like a particle without mass, which does not interact with the Higgs field. It doesn't interact with the Higgs field, it doesn't have a mass, it travels always at the speed of light, like, for example, the photon, the particle of light. Or maybe you've only got snowshoes. In that case, you sink into the snow, you interact with the Higgs field, you move slower than the skier. And that's like a particle with a mass, like an electron, for example. And of course, if you don't have snowshoes, you sink very deeply into the snow. You go very, very slowly. And that's like a particle which interacts very strongly with the Higgs field and gets a very big mass and travels much less than the speed of light. So that's a very simple analogy, but you can take it further. So what is snow made of? Snow is made of snowflakes. And similarly, this Higgs snow field has a fundamental constituent proposed by Peter Higgs, which is what we call the Higgs boson. If you like, it's the snowflake of the standard model. So Peter Higgs proposed his uh, theory back in 1964, but uh, people didn't pay a lot of attention for quite a number of years. Uh, 1975, together with my colleagues, Mary Gaillard and Dimitri Nanopoulos, we started thinking about what a Higgs boson would look like in experiments. But at that time, it was a very speculative idea. And we were a little bit cautious. So at the end of our paper, we wrote, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. Well, fortunately, have you already heard from Sally, experimentalists, sensible people like Katevi did not take our bad advice. And instead, they built the Large Hadron Collider to answer Gauguin's questions in general, and in particular, to look for the Higgs boson. So the Large Hadron Collider is in the tunnel about 100 meters underground. Here's a picture inside the tunnel. Those blue things are casings of magnets curving away into the distance. So the tunnel of the LHC is about 27 kilometers in circumference. And when it's operating, there are thousands of billions of protons going in opposite directions, making billions of collisions every second. And with those collisions, we hope to understand the origin of mass, the nature of dark matter. We'll study the primordial plasma that filled the universe when it was very young. And we'll also look at the difference between matter and antimatter. So these are four pictures taken some years ago of the insides of the four biggest detectors at the LHC. Very big. If you look in the top right hand picture, you can see uh, a very small person. That's not a, a Lego toy person, that's a full size person. And that picture is the Atlas experiment in which Katevi works, which together with CMS in the bottom left hand corner discovered the Higgs boson and is now searching for dark matter. And the other experiments are looking for the cosmic plasma and looking at the difference between matter and antimatter. 
Now I'd like to emphasize that experiments at CERN are done by literally thousands of physicists from around the world. And uh, here's a picture of the universities and research institutes where they all come from. Uh, so far, there's not so many uh, in African countries, although South Africa, Egypt, Algeria, and Morocco do send physicists to work at CERN. This, on the other hand, is where the physicists come from, what passports they carry. And you see here that many more African countries are present at CERN. And I think this shows that CERN is open to people from anywhere. And I think it indicates that what we do is of universal interest. And I hope that in the future, we'll see some of you at CERN also. OK, but let me get back to the discovery of the Higgs boson which took place in 2012, as you've already heard from Sally. So uh, I would observe that there was great excitement, what I call mass hysteria in the particle physics community, when the discovery of, the, of a new particle was announced by the Atlas collaboration and by CMS. So here's one picture of one event from Atlas. So you've got a computer generated image of the Atlas detector. Uh, you can see some curved yellow lines, which are charged tracks bending in the magnetic field. And you can see some straight red lines. And those are energetic particles that might have come from the decay of the Higgs boson. And I should say that Katevi was deeply involved in this particular observation by the Atlas experiment. So here's an event observed by the CMS collaboration. Again, you see those curved charged tracks. And you two, see two red lines without tracks. Without tracks, that means that they are neutral particles, very energetic because there's a big red blobs of energy. And those might have come from a pair of photons that might have come from the decay of a Higgs boson, something that we had calculated back in 1975. So on July the 4th, 2012, physicists were very happy. And I like this picture because you see on the right, Peter Higgs. And in the middle, you see Francois Angler, who proposed a very similar theory. And although they proposed their ideas 48 years previously, they had never met until this moment. So they were pretty happy. I also like this picture because circled you see Fabiola Giannotti, who announced the discovery on behalf of the Atlas collaboration that day and is now the Director General of CERN. So just telling you, no glass ceiling at CERN. OK, so what Atlas and CMS did was they announced they discovered a new particle. And they were looking for the Higgs boson. But was the particle that they found actually the Higgs boson, or was it perhaps something different? It's a little bit like you're trying to do a jigsaw puzzle. There's a piece that's been missing for 48 years, and then you find something, a piece of bent cardboard in the back of the sofa. Is that the missing jigsaw piece? So together with my then PhD student, Tivong Yu, we set out to answer that question. There's a prediction of the theory that the Higgs boson gives masses to other particles. And that means that the coupling between the Higgs and those other particles should be proportional to their masses. So on this plot here, which has the mass on the horizontal axis and the coupling on the vertical axis, you should get a straight line. That's the red line, which is the prediction of the standard model. And what you see is that the data indicated by the black points are very consistent with that. So Peter Higgs could smile. And he can continue to smile because that sort of analysis has been done much more precisely, much more completely by Atlas and CMS, again with the same conclusion. The data are completely consistent with the Higgs boson. 
2013, the Nobel Prize Committee uh, gave the prize to Peter Higgs and Francois Anglaire. And in their citation, they said, today we believe that beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. So my student and I were very proud because that quotation was taken from one of our papers. But what the Nobel Prize Committee apparently didn't know was that although we'd written that in our paper, when we sent it to a journal to be published, the journal said, no, 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 no. Beyond any reasonable doubt is not a scientific judgment. You have to take that statement out of your paper. So we did, the paper was published, but the Nobel Prize Committee picked up on the original version of our paper. So as I already mentioned, the Higgs is a big deal. Without it, there'd be no atoms because electrons would run away from nuclei at the speed of light. There'd be no heavy nuclei. Weak interactions would not be weak. Uh, everybody would not just glow in the dark, life would be completely impossible. So the existence of the Higgs boson is a big deal. So what next? What about the other Gauguin questions? What is the LHC trying to do now? So here I take my cue from James Bond with one or two small modifications. And I paraphrase the title of his movie. The standard model is not enough. And his number is 007. So I give 007 reasons for saying there must be physics beyond the standard model. So one is that in the standard model with no additional features, empty space would be unstable. And I'll explain why in a moment. The standard model does not explain dark matter. It doesn't explain the origin of matter. It doesn't explain why particle masses have the sizes that they do. It makes masses possible, but it doesn't explain how big they are. It doesn't explain the properties of neutrinos. It doesn't explain how the universe got to be so big and old. It doesn't provide a quantum theory of gravity. So there's many big questions beyond the standard model. And I hope that the new students will be able to contribute to resolving some of these Gauguin questions. Experimentally, one way to tackle those questions is with the LHC, and I'll discuss a little bit of that in a moment. So first of all, the instability of empty space. So the issue is illustrated here. So you can think of the horizontal axis in this picture as being the value of the Higgs field. How deep is the Higgs snowfield? And we currently have a relatively small amount of Higgs. But over on the right hand side there, there's another possible state of the universe with much denser Higgs field. And if we were there, the universe would collapse under its own weight. So we're over there on the left, but according to quantum physics, the state of the universe must fluctuate. And at some level, there's a danger that it would go through that barrier there and finish up in this big crunch state. And that would be catastrophic. Actually, that's not the only problem. Another issue is how come we avoided the big crunch already? Because in the early universe, quantum fluctuations would have been enormous. And you would have expected that we would have fluctuated over and through the barrier 13.8 billion years ago. So why didn't we? Well, one possibility is that there is some barrier, some wall that prevents us from falling into that big crunch. Uh, and that infinite barrier 
could be provided by a theory called supersymmetry, which I'll discuss in a moment. So another big problem associated with cosmology is dark matter. So this was proposed in the 1930s by Fritz Wicke, who was looking at a cluster of galaxies called Coma. And he observed that the galaxies were moving around each other too fast. What do I mean by too fast? So they're held together by gravity. You need a strong gravitational field to hold the coma cluster together. And that extra gravitational field is much more than what's provided by the visible matter. And Fritz said, there must be additional dark matter. So I'm not quite sure whether I can do his uh, finger gesture, but uh, anyway, <laughs> it's a piece of dark matter. So not a lot of people paid attention to Fritz's proposal until the 1970s, when the astronomer Vera Rubin, whom you see here, observed the motions of stars and other material going around galaxies. And she found that they also orbit too quickly. So she said that also inside galaxies, we need a stronger gravitational field than provided by the visible matter, maybe dark matter. And, and subsequent to her work, I think lots of people got convinced, and there's now many other pieces of evidence for dark matter on all sorts of different scales in the universe. So here's an example of the sort of observation that Vera made. So the horizontal axis is the distance from the center of a galaxy, which you see in the bottom left-hand corner. And what you see here is that even way beyond the size of the visible galaxy, things orbiting have roughly the same speeds. And that's not what you'd expect if the only matter in the galaxy was provided by the stars or by the gas. There has to be something else dark because we can't see it, the so-called dark halo. So what is this dark matter? Is it possible that it's made out of some sort of particle? And if it is, then maybe we could find those particles at the LHC. So one theory is that uh, all the known types of particle have uh, partners, partners which have the same electric charge and other internal properties represented by their colors, but these partner particles would have much larger masses represented by their circles being much bigger. So some of those partner particles might be stable, and if they're stable, they might still be present in the universe today as relics from the Big Bang. So this is uh, an illustration of what I'm talking about. Over on the left-hand side, you see the particles of the standard model, you see uh, the quarks, you see the electron, you see the photon, you see the Higgs boson. And then over on the right, you see their partner particles, which have little twiddles on top. And those twiddles represent the fact that they have different internal spins. And one of those particles might be the dark matter, probably some combination of the partner of the photon, the Higgs boson, and the Z boson. So how would you look for dark matter, in particular supersymmetric particles, if they exist? So, so you can't see the supersymmetric particles, the dark matter particles directly, because dark matter particles don't have electric charge, they interact only very weakly. However, they do carry energy and momentum. And so the idea is that you look for events where the visible energy 
represented in this picture, in this picture by the, the towers that you see on the left-hand side and the histograms that you see on the right-hand side. So in this simulation, there's a whole bunch of energy coming out on one side, but nothing visible on the other side. Nothing visible, but momentum has to be balanced. And so the idea is that there must be invisible dark matter particles on the other side. So Atlas and CMS have been looking for such things, but they haven't seen them yet. So far, there's no sign of supersymmetry at the LHC. I should say that the experiments have looked for many other signs of physics beyond the standard model. They haven't found anything else either, but they're still looking. And there's all sorts of new ways that people have proposed to look for unknown particles at the LHC. And uh, this will be an act active area of research when the LHC restarts, we hope, next year. There are other ways in which you can look for dark matter. For example, according to the astronomers, there would be particles of dark matter going through us all the time. We just can't see them. But maybe if we go deep underground in a cavern shielded from cosmic rays, we might be able to see very rare events where a dark matter particle comes through hits the nucleus, and then that recoil deposits energy that we can measure. So there's experiments around the world that are looking for that. Uh, so far, they haven't seen events either, but they are looking very closely. So I've talked about uh, a couple of problems needing physics beyond the standard model. Let me now talk about a third one, antimatter. So uh, I think everybody is interested in antimatter. Uh, it was important in Star Trek. I actually watched a science fiction movie yesterday evening, which was talking about antimatter. And there's also an interest in antimatter, which was triggered by the movie angels and demons of a few years ago. Although I should say that uh, we physicists don't make enough antimatter to destroy the Vatican, nor to power up the Starship Enterprise. What we're interested in is the differences, the very small differences that exist between matter and antimatter. So let me explain a little bit about antimatter. So its existence was predicted by the physicist Dirac, whom you see here. He tried to combine special relativity and quantum mechanics, and he found that for that to be possible, he needed that particles should have partners with the same mass but opposite internal properties such as electric charge. So antimatter is not the same thing as supersymmetric particles. Antimatter particles have the same mass, but different internal properties. Supersymmetric particles have the same internal properties, but different masses. And antimatter particles have actually been discovered. They've been discovered in cosmic rays. Uh, they've been studied in detail using accelerators. And they're actually used in medical applications. For example, there's a diagnostic technique called positron emission tomography, where the P stands for positron, which is the antiparticle of the E, which is the electron. Now it came as a big surprise in the 1960s when experiments discovered that matter and antimatter are not quite equal and opposite. We don't really know why. We've got a description, but we don't really have a theory, a fundamental theory of how and why they differ. But one possibility is that that very small laboratory difference between matter and antimatter could explain why the universe contains blobs of matter like you and me, 
but no blobs of antimatter. In other words, it could explain the origin of the visible matter in the universe. And experiments at CERN and elsewhere are studying matter-antimatter differences to see if they can find the answer. Now, I'd like to come back to this guy, Albert Einstein, who were uh, dreamt of unifying all the fundamental interactions and making a quantum theory of gravity. Well, he didn't succeed. And maybe that's why in this picture, Albert looks a little bit sad. But one of the ideas that he played with was the possibility of unification of the fundamental forces to extra dimensions of space, which is a very popular idea amongst theorists nowadays. And in some of those extra dimensional theories, gravity becomes strong at LHC energies, and you might be able to produce microscopic black holes at the LHC. So this got some people worried some years ago. They said, well, if you make black holes, maybe you can eat up the whole Earth. Well, of course, that would not happen. These microscopic black holes would vanish instantly. They're no, no danger to the Earth. But they would be very exciting because if we could observe a black hole, that would really give us a window on quantum gravity. So this is a, a graphic which is uh, taken from a magazine of economics, would you believe, which shows you the time lapse between particles being proposed and discovered. And in the case of the Higgs boson, that time lag was 48 years. And in that time, Peter Higgs evolved from looking something like this picture to looking something like this picture. 48 years is a long time. And I think it is a warning that those of us who want to look at supersymmetry or some other physics beyond the standard model have to be prepared to be patient. It may take a while. So what are the future? So the LHC will continue to work in future years. It will operate for maybe 15 more years, maybe more, uh, making more and more collisions. And beyond that, there are ideas for possible future accelerators. Uh, for example, we have an idea for a future circular collider around Geneva with a tunnel which is like 100 meters uh, around, which would be able to explore directly energies 10 times higher than what we can explore with the LHC. But that's, that's for the future. And I hope I've convinced you that uh, the LHC is the most powerful microscope in the world, but also in some sense, it's a telescope which is able to address Gauguin's questions. So that, that's the main physics that I wanted to discuss. But I just wanted to say a little bit more, which uh, may be of personal interest to uh, you students who are following this lecture. So I've talked about the established scientists from around the world who do research at CERN. Uh, we also welcome students. So, for example, every uh, summer we have uh, summer schools which uh, welcome, as you can see, students from around the world, including Africa. Uh, we also have programs for high school teachers. I just mentioned summer student programs. We have schools for young researchers in uh, Europe. Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And of course, we have more advanced courses as well. So uh, these are some pictures of uh, students in some of these summer schools. 
And I'd like to mention in particular the African School of Physics, which is organized by Katevi in particular, and which gets support from a number of universities and research institutes around the world, including CERN, but also many others. Another thing which I'd just like to remind you of before closing is that the sort of research we do at CERN has many applications beyond particle physics. So concretely, the World Wide Web was born at CERN just over 30 years ago. It was invented by Tim Berners-Lee, whom you see here. The purpose being to enable physicists around the world to share their data. So where would we be today if we did not have the World Wide Web in the time of COVID? The World Wide Web is used for communications, for transferring news, distributing scientific results. Video conferences like this one use the tools provided by the World Wide Web. Social networks, maybe that's not such a good thing, but anyway, we use it all the time. Business, particularly in Europe, the United States has become dependent on the World Wide Web to enable people to work at home, to do their online shopping, and so on and so forth. And I think everybody uses the World Wide Web and tools based on it for entertainment, music, films, and so on. So the fact that, sir, that the world is able to operate today in the way that it does in the time of COVID is in large measure due to CERN. And CERN is also active in itself in the time of COVID. So CERN set up a task force to contribute to the worldwide fight, collaborates with the World Health Organization. It's made resources available, such as its distributed computing network, its mechanical workshops. And uh, for example, uh, physicists working at CERN have developed a uh, relatively cheap ventilator that could be used to treat uh, patients with COVID. Uh, I mentioned the use of CERN's distributed computing network, which is being used to analyze the structure of proteins in the coronavirus. And to finish, I would just like to mention that uh, Katevi has organized the African School of Physics to also try to make a contribution in the time of COVID. So uh, he set up a network of alumni of the African School of Physics who are setting up uh, epidemiological models to use to uh, study the evolution of the COVID outbreaks in their countries and hopefully thereby provide tools and advice for the governments in African countries to cope with the COVID pandemic. Okay, that's all I wanted to say and uh, now I'd be very happy uh, to receive your questions and I, I hope that I can provide at least some answers. So thanks a lot, John, for this wonderful presentation. So we will take then the question now in any time of domain, and we could answer them fully one by one. So feel free otherwise to write your questions as well on the chat. Or did anybody understood then exactly where we're coming from? So maybe this is why they're silent. <laughs> There's one person who raised their hands, Chris, uh, Christine. Yeah, so yeah, then please, can you unmute your microphone and ask your question? Yeah. Good day, everyone. Uh, yeah. 
Hello. Yeah, can, can you hear me, John? Yeah, perfect. Okay. That was a very nice presentation. Thank you very much. I've got a lot, I've got a couple of questions for you, please. The first oh. question, there was a particular slide. You showed the result of an experiment which you had with your students mm -hmm. to, corral, to corroborate the result of the Higgs boson. Could you go back to that slide, please? Okay, let me start, try and uh, find it. I should clarify that this wasn't yeah, you a plot graph. It was wasn't a it? graph. You plot a graph. You plot yeah. a graph there. Yeah, so talking we, about we, the line of. Yeah, so we we didn't do the experiment ourselves. We just analyzed the data provided by the uh, Atlas and CMS experiments. Oh, so like okay, one thing I want like the thing I like to confirm about the results is this: like, does this experiment or probably the data? Does it have anything to do with SSB? I mean, spontaneous symmetric breakdown? Right. So spontaneous symmetry breakdown is uh, sort of maybe the benefit of uh, everybody uh, who's present in this uh, video conference. Spontaneous symmetry breakdown is the way that we often you describe this idea of uh, creating this uh, universal field extending throughout space. So, so w why do we call it SSB, symmetry breakdown? Why do we talk about symmetry being broken? Uh, because before that Higgs field gets switched on, uh, all the particles have zero mass, and so there is some sort of a symmetry between them. So for example, if I look at this picture here, I've got the top quark over here, and I've got the bottom quark down there, and I've got the charm down there. And before you switch on this universal Higgs snowfield, they're all massless. So there's some sort of a symmetry between them. When the Higgs field switches on, that symmetry is broken, and that's what we call uh, SSB. So according to the theory of SSB, uh, the masses of these various different particles are proportional to the coupling of the Higgs to those particles. And those couplings are what I call lambda here on the left-hand side. And so that pr the prediction then of the theory of SSB is that the couplings should be proportional to the mass. And what you see here, so these are the points that we took from the data, they lie on that line. So that's uh, consistent with the theory of SSB or mass generation. Okay, uh, thank you, I got that. Um, there's this other thing I want to confirm from you. Like okay. uh, there's this situation you discussed, the supposed collapsing of the universe. Right. Like I want to know, this idea of the collapse of the universe is a premonition or an assumption or a theory or what? And if so, there's this other question about it. If so, I learned that, like somebody told me a time, a couple of, uh, some times ago, that the universe will feel a negative pressure that will make it to collapse. Like, where is the negative pressure coming from? Okay. So, so first of all, uh, in the standard model, if we calculate uh, what happens with the measured mass of the Higgs boson and the other particles in the theory, we find this instability. Uh, and that instability is a quantum instability. And it tells us that at some point, we can't predict exactly when, we can estimate roughly speaking how long it might take, but eventually the universe would collapse. And uh, you know, as far as I can tell, that's a, a rigorous prediction once you know what the masses of the particles are. Of course, there's some question about how well we know the masses of the particles, but if you do know the masses, then that's what's going to happen, unless you put in uh, additional physics. So that theory where we uh, fall into this uh, big crunch involves, uh, in some sense, a very large pressure, but positive pressure. It's not the same thing as what you were just mentioning of negative pressure. So negative pressure 
has the feature that it causes the expansion rate of the universe to increase. And if I go back to one of my very early slides, so this picture shows you the expansion of the universe. And uh, well, you can see it's expanding. But what you can also see, if you go up here, for example, is that that expansion seems to be accelerating. And uh, that would be due to some sort of negative pressure, as you mentioned. And we don't really know what the origin of that negative pressure might be. Uh, we call it dark energy. Uh, which is not the same thing as dark matter, um, but we really don't know. We don't have a good theory of dark energy. Okay, that that brings me to my next question. Like, um, like, is there no correlation at all? I mean, is there no correlation at all between dark energy and dark matter? Okay, so so dark matter is something that gravitates in the normal way. Uh, so it actually behaves a, a lot like dust and it, gravity causes it to clump together. Whereas dark energy, because of this negative pressure, tends to repel itself. So it doesn't cluster, it doesn't uh, accompany galaxies or clusters of galaxies. In fact, it fills empty space in between the galaxies and the clusters. Uh, so they're completely different physical phenomena. Now, maybe you could construct some unified theory of dark matter and dark energy, but that will be you know, another step. Okay. Uh, this other question, like this question is not actually scientific though. Like um, I'm just, I was just, I was just, I'm just reasoning. Like, when the man that actually talked about the idea of dark energy, the dark matter rather, which uh, like I've forgotten his name, but you mentioned his name earlier. Like, do yeah. you like do you have any idea of what exactly he had in mind before he named that matter dark matter? Why he chose the word dark? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> I think it was called dark because you couldn't see it. Actually, the phrase dark matter was around earlier been used by other people but it meant something rather didn't exactly correspond to what Fritz Wicke proposed so that that's why I, I credit him with proposing dark matter in the form that we understand it today although people had to, talked about dark matter in a less precise way earlier on if, excuse me I, I thank you for your questions they're very very good questions but I wonder whether there's other people uh, in the lecture who would like to ask some questions also. Is there anybody else? Yeah, there are, uh, there are some. Christine, we cannot hear you, okay? You are muted. Yeah, so sorry. So there were some questions from Sola. So that would be nice indeed if you could uh, uh, present them. Or do you want that we read them, Sola? Hi, uh, Prof. Uh, thank you for the, for the talk. It was very nice. As, uh, I think it's just two questions that I have. Um, so earlier in the talk, you mentioned that uh, dark matter might have appeared a few picoseconds after the Big Bang. <clears throat> um, do you, are, there, are there like particles that you, that you know of that might have appeared before the dark matter was proposed to have appeared after the Big Bang? Okay, well, thank you for that question. So, so, so here is this little sort of a brief history of the universe that I, uh, I gave you earlier on. And uh, basically, as you go down uh, in this picture, you go up in energy or in mass of particles, and you go back to the beginning of time. So beginning of the universe, bigger energies, and the further back you go, the bigger are the energies, the bigger are the masses of the particles that you might produce. So 
I put down here appearance of mass with a question mark. That's because we think, now we know, I think, that the appearance of mass is associated with the Higgs boson. And we know what the mass of the Higgs boson is. So we know the time at which that would have occurred and we know the temperature that we've got a good handle on. Now there's many theories where there are other particles, like I mentioned supersymmetry, for example. In supersymmetry, we can also estimate when those particles might have been uh, filling the universe and when those particles might have eventually uh, sort of dissociated, decoupled from the visible matter in the universe. And uh, that's what I meant when I put in this appearance of dark matter. So that dark matter particles themselves might be somewhat heavier and there might have been a lot of them earlier on in the history of the universe. But where I put it between a picosecond and a microsecond, that is when the dark matter particles we think might have separated off from the rest of the matter particles in the universe. Okay. And then uh, <clears throat> the second question is, uh, what properties do, does, does an object need to have in order to be regarded as a particle? Because I, 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 just, I just saw like a short definition on Wikipedia that a, a particle may be regarded as a particle if, uh, it may be regarded as a localized object if that particle has a volume, density, or mass. But as far as I know, a, a, a photon has neither of these. So what properties of a photon make it regarded as a mass, as a, as a particle? Okay. Well, I think we would regard as a particle any very small concentration of, of energy that cannot be uh, broken up into constituent pieces. Mm. So an electron is, is clearly like that, right? As far as we can tell, there's no internal structure to the electron. People have been looking, and uh, if it has a size, it's, it's very, very small, much smaller, much, much smaller, thousands of times smaller than the size of a proton or a neutron. And protons and neutrons are examples of objects that we would not regard as particles, at least not elementary particles, in the sense that I'm using. Now the photon, also, as far as we can tell, has no internal structure. As you say, it doesn't have a mass, but it does have energy. Uh, every photon has an amount of energy corresponding to its frequency and inversely related to its wavelength. And uh, you know, from, a, from my point of view, uh, a photon is just as much of a particle as the electron is. For example, gravity, obviously it acts on electrons, but gravity also acts on photons, and gravity acts on photons through their energies. Okay, but <clears throat> since, since, since the, the photon has a localized amount of energy, doesn't it mean that by Einstein's mass, mass energy equivalence equation that it must have a mass? So, uh, so this E equals mc squared, that, that refers to particles which are at rest. So for example, you or I, we're at least approximately at rest and uh, the energy which we carry in some sense, in Einstein's sense, is given by our rest mass m. Uh, now, we know that if you give a particle anything a velocity, then its energy increases. And at uh, non-relativistic speeds, that additional energy is just the kinetic energy. So it's a half m velocity squared. Now, if a velocity approaches uh, the speed of light, then you get you know, a very big increase in the uh, energy of the particle. It could even be much bigger than the rest mass of the particle. And the photon is somehow the extreme limit of that where the particle is traveling at the speed of light and uh, it actually has no rest mass. It's never at rest. It's always traveling very fast. Mm. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome. So we have maybe um, a kind of question that you could answer as well. So by uh, Kondwani. So asking about, uh, yeah, if the university is expanding up to some level, then what's going to happen afterward if it uh, explodes? Yeah, well, uh, it's a good question. Um, and uh, we don't really know the answer. So I, I, I've shown this uh, picture here a couple of times. And uh, it kind of looks, if nothing changes, as if the universe will go, just go on expanding forever. But you know, things may change, and things may change in particular because of the quantum effects. And uh, that's what I meant when I was talking about this picture here, where we see the possibility that because of uh, quantum effects, there will be a change of state and we will dive from the current state of the universe into this big crunch. So I, I've written here tunnel through barrier now. According to our calculations, it's possible that it might happen in the next fraction of a second. It might be that between the time when I say something, before my words reach you, the universe would collapse. We don't know. Very unlikely, very, very, very unlikely, but it's possible. So, so we don't know whether this quantum, quantum instability will cause the universe to collapse, maybe in 10 to 100 years time. Um, well, I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think that, uh, first of all, I think there's new physics which stops the universe from collapsing. And uh, even if it is going to collapse, you know, terrible things will kill us off before then. Yeah, so you have maybe another way out with extra dimension space. So that was one of the questions from site. So if you could maybe come back to that uh, definition, or maybe said can uh, ask a specific question that you wanted to understand. The extra dimension space. Yeah. Site, yeah. Uh, sorry, you, know, you made mention of uh, usage of extra dimension space to do some advanced study. Like, I don't know, could you just say like some things about the extra dimension space? I think I'm getting to don't extra dimension space. Yeah, well, so uh, in school, uh, we all learned uh, Euclidean geometry, right? And uh, Euclid talked about points, which are a little bit like those point particles we were discussing earlier on. And he talked about lines, uh, which are a little bit like uh, you know, the trajectories of particles through space. And those lines would be infinitely thin. And the points would be infinitely small. But you know, maybe that's not quite right. And maybe if we could build a really, really, really good microscope, we might be able to see that uh, what we think of as a point might actually be extended in some way. And what we think of as a line, the trajectory of a particle might actually also be extended. So the, uh, the simplest possibility is that things are extended in uh, one dimension. So I, I just trying to find a piece of, yeah, here we go. So I don't know if you can see uh, those pictures. Yeah, sure, I can. We can. Uh, okay, good. So if you're going to extend a particle out from being a pure point, the simplest thing would be to extend it in one direction. That would give you a, a one-dimensional object. Uh, so it might be a string with two ends, or it might be a, a string that goes around in circles. Okay, so, so, so that's one of the ideas that uh, theorists are playing with. But it turns out that if you want to make a consistent theory of that, you would need that in addition to the regular three dimensions of space and one time that uh, we know and love, 
there would have to be additional dimensions of space. And so the idea would be that uh, what Euclid thought of as a line is in fact itself extended in invisible extra dimensions that we can't see. So you should think of each Euclidean line as being uh, like, a, like a tube. Uh, and an ordinary particle like an electron sort of goes along the tube like that. But then there could be excited particles, heavier particles, which are sort of going around the tube like that. And experiments at the LHC have been looking for evidence of, if you like, particles going around those very small tubes, but they haven't seen any yet. Thank you, Undat. Thanks. Okay, so then we have a question from Ahmed as well. So trying to see, so with uh, uh, the X field, so could it be as well another type that uh, would explain as well the, for the dark matter particles, the mass of the dark matter particles? So, so the, the question was whether the Higgs field could explain the masses of dark matter particles? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I think I would say probably not. I think that um, most of the theories that I know about, uh, the dark matter particles get their masses in a different way. And uh, well, for example, I, I, we were just talking about those theories with extra dimensions. So, so the lightest of those particles going around the extra dimensions, uh, that might be stable. Uh, and that might be a good dark matter candidate. Uh, but in that case, that particle would not get its mass from the Higgs field. It would get its mass from essentially the size of that extra dimensional tube. So, so we think that the Higgs gives masses to the particles of the standard model, but very likely when you're talking about other particles, uh, they would get their masses from some other origin. Actually, John, the question was whether there is another type, another Higgs that will give mass to the dark matter particles, not the one that we have discovered. Yeah, well, that, that's what I'm saying. It, it would be something else. It would not be our Higgs boson. It, it might be uh, a different type of Higgs boson, or it might be something completely different. It would presumably not be our Higgs boson. Okay, so then we have a question by Kosi. So saying that, uh, so about the rapid expansion of the universe, so many scientists assume, so the existence of the graviton. So how quantum gravity can explain the expansion of uh, the universe? Do you think that uh, a graviton can be confirmed experimentally like the Higgs boson? Okay, so yeah, I certainly think that uh, there must be a graviton. So when I showed the particles of the standard model, I uh, didn't include uh, the graviton, but uh, I did show uh, along the bottom line here, the particles associated with other fundamental forces. So uh, in the middle there, we've got the photon gamma associated with electromagnetism. And then there's a heavy particle called W associated with a weak force. And over on the right-hand side, it's not given a name there, but the particle associated with the strong nuclear force is called the gluon. In exactly the same way, we think that in a quantum theory of gravity, you would inevitably have a quantum of the gravitational field over on the left-hand side. That's what we call the graviton. Now, to actually observe it, that is an enormous experimental challenge. It's a very big challenge because at the level of elementary particles, gravity is very, very weak. I mean, the gravitational force between an electron and a nucleus is something like 40 orders of magnitude weaker than the electromagnetic force. So people really don't know how to set about looking for a graviton. They just think that gravitons certainly exist, but they must be very, very weakly coupled to the rest of matter. So that's a challenge. So, so maybe you folks 
should rise to the challenge and figure out a way of detecting the graviton. And uh, if you did, then there would for sure be some prize waiting for you in Stockholm. Very good. So then there was a, a question by uh, so Kennedy. So does the dark energy pool uh, so the universal portal closer? So the dark energy pushes the universe apart and uh, causes this rapid expansion or the, or the big rip. And uh, as I mentioned, we, we think that there is dark energy in the universe uh, today. And that's what's causing this uh, effect here where the expansion of the universe is accelerating. But we think that way back just after the Big Bang, there might well have been a similar period of accelerated expansion, which is illustrated here. I haven't discussed that. Um, that period of accelerated expansion could explain why the universe is so big and old today. And it could be due to something like dark energy. It could be driven by some field of energy like the Higgs boson. And in fact, people have even proposed that that first burst of expansion might have been driven by the Higgs boson itself. Although personally, I rather doubt that. Okay, very good. So then we have a question from uh, Mohamed. So Mohamed, if you want to run and ask your question. Yes, uh, hello. Hello, Salam Alaikum. Salam. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm uh, asking about uh, the uh, quantization of uh, in, um, uh, uh, gravity. I'm asking about uh, why do we need to quantize gravity from the very beginning? I'm 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 asking. Um, uh, we uh, I I uh, learned that uh, gravity can be considered as a uh, geometrical effect in the general uh, relativity. It's a uh, ge uh, geometrical effect uh, due to the existence of masses. Okay, and uh, uh, and. When we talked about uh, gauge uh, symmetries and how they uh, they like uh, force us to to include uh, forces in the theory, um, uh, can we uh, find a, a certain gauge symmetry that uh, uh, makes uh, gravity emerges as a force, a fundamental force? Yeah, okay, well, well thank you for that question. There's a lot of, a lot of content in your question. Yeah. So uh, indeed, uh, if we go back to uh, gauge theories, so the theories that we have of the uh, other fundamental interactions, uh, the ones that I had on the slide here. Okay, so, so the forces of electromagnetism, the weak and strong interactions, those are all what we call uh, gauge theories. And uh, it's a general feature of those theories that you have particles and those particles generate forces. Or you could look at things around the other way and you say, well, you've got a force, you must also have a particle. And that's what I was arguing earlier on. Gravity, it, there must also be a particle associated with it uh, called the graviton. Now, as you were mentioning earlier on, and is illustrated in the bottom left-hand picture on the slide, uh, gravity can be regarded on a large scale 
as the bending of space by massive particles. But we believe that as, for example, the quantum particles fluctuate, then they're necessarily going to cause that bending of space also to fluctuate. So just think about it. Imagine that instead of that big ball in the bottom left hand picture, it was an electron. And I think everybody agrees, well, the electron you know, jumps around according to the laws of quantum physics. So the electron at some level also bends the background of space. So that background is also going to fluctuate according to quantum mechanics. And so you must necessarily have fluctuations in the space-time background. And those fluctuations would correspond to gravitons. All right, so uh, can we find a, a certain gauge symmetry that uh, incorporates this? Right, right. Sign? exactly. That, that, that's the next question. And uh, people have discussed that uh, in the past. Um, certainly you can do that. I, I'm not sure whether it's a very productive way of thinking about gravity. Uh, and I must confess, I've never looked at those theories in, uh, in great detail. But in principle, yes. Uh, so uh, there are uh, existing uh, theories uh, that uh, uh, reject uh, gravity as a, uh, a uh, like a uh, product of a gauge symmetry or something like uh, the same way uh, uh, electromagnetism and the other forces emerge. Well, 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 one example uh, is, the, uh, is the string theory that I was discussing uh, a few minutes ago. Yeah. So, so here's my picture of strings again, okay? Yes, yes. So uh, those strings can vibrate in all sorts of different ways. And the lowest frequency vibrations those correspond to particles of low mass. And among those light particles, there are particles of spin one, which correspond to the, uh, for example, to the photon in this picture. And at the very same time, there would be a particle of spin two, which would correspond to the graviton, which would be the quantum of the gravitational force in the bottom left-hand corner. So, String theory is an example of a theory which, uh, because of its structure, predicts the existence of massless particles, massless particles which look just like the photon or the graviton. And it, it does it you know, at the same time, if you like, in parallel. All right. Uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. So we have uh, another question so from me and all. So if uh, so we take into account the cosmological principle that the universe is uh, homogeneous or isotropic, so how can we explain the expansion of the universe? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's no contradiction between the two. If it's homogeneous and isotropic, uh, that just tells us that it's like a big ball, of course, a big ball in a higher number of dimensions. And uh, you can imagine you know, pumping up that big ball to make it bigger. And that's, for example, what uh, dark energy would do. And uh, that's completely consistent with the cosmological principle because the ball you know, would remain spherical, just get to be a bigger sphere. Now, the interesting thing is that actually, because of these same quantum effects that we were discussing a moment ago, if you make a, a quantum universe, then you must get fluctuations, and so you must get deviations from the cosmological principle. Uh, the universe is not going to be quite homogeneous and isotropic. There's going to be bumps in the universe, and we see them in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which I haven't commented on, but it appears example in this picture here. So over on the left hand side you see this sort of 
whoops, colorful picture, so it looks a bit flattened here. But that's what we see with our telescopes when we look up at the sky. We see radiation, background radiation coming from just after the Big Bang, which is almost but not quite homogeneous and isotropic. And we think that we think that's a result of quantum effects. And those quantum effects, of course, violate uh, locally the cosmological principle. If you average out, they don't. They average out to giving you a uh, spherical universe, but locally they give you little fluctuations. And we actually think that those fluctuations then gave rise to the structures that we see in the universe today, all the galaxies and so on. So these structures that we see in the universe now would have originated in those little fluctuations in the universe when it was very young. And they would all come from quantum effects. So cosmological principle would be violated locally because after all we do see galaxies. But if you average out over a large enough uh, area of space, then you would recover the cosmological principle. Good. Now we have as well a question from Stefan. So Stefan, you want to ask the question? Thank you. Thank you for the good lecture. My question is about large hadron collider. Remember, you say that uh, in future we are aiming at constructing it smaller in size, like 100 meters in size. So, what is your opinion uh, for these large hadron collider to be constructed? To be constructed in different parts of the world to make sure that the physics uh, gets ample time to do a lot of experiments so we are having uh, in different parts of the world so do, you, do you aspire to or what is your opinion can you champion such that we can have as many larger drone colliders in the world Sorry, I'm not quite sure that I understood correctly your question. The sound quality was, was not so great, but so there are actually uh, two projects in the world uh, for building a large 100 kilometer tunnel uh, to collide particles. And uh, I've got the logos for the two projects on the top of this slide. So in the middle, there's something called FCC, which is a project coordinated by CERN. And on the top right hand side there, I've got something called CEPC SPPC, which is a project which is uh, being proposed in China. Uh, so conceptually, they're, they're very similar. Uh, both of them 100 meter, 100 kilometer tunnels. Uh, both of them give you the possibilities of colliding electrons and uh, positrons or, or protons. And you collide electrons and positrons. You can do very precise measurements, uh, maybe tell us more about the Higgs, maybe find some deviation of its properties from the standard model prediction. And uh, by colliding protons, you can go to much higher energies, and then you can maybe make uh, much heavier types of particle. And uh, so th these would be, uh, I think, obviously they're very big projects, expensive projects and uh, they probably would need the uh, collaboration of many countries from around the world. Certainly at CERN uh, we would want to collaborate with everybody who is interested. Uh, China, I, I don't know, they have a slightly different attitude. Okay, thank you very much. Good. Christine, could you read uh, the question from people who have not asked yet? There's, uh, yeah, so Ozra, Ozra, yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> already asked. So for Osa, so so after the big crunch, do you think that the universe is transforming or tunneling to extra dimension space, or is it going backward to the point of uh, the Big Bang? So it, it doesn't actually quite go back to the Big Bang, and uh, it's perhaps a slightly incorrect to call it a big crunch. Uh, it would transform into something called an anti-de-sitter space 
which has a very different type of geometry. And uh, what happens after that, who knows? So if you excuse me, folks, uh, I, follow up. I probably so, need in a few minutes to be moving on. I got uh, some other things that I need to do. Okay, so uh -huh. if, we will uh, then thanks a lot. So John for all those questions and if there are some specific questions, maybe I guess that the students are welcome to, to ask you as well by email. Point. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think on the web page, uh, uh, yeah, the Indigo page, there is uh, my uh, email address. And uh, you know, I thank you for all the questions, lots of excellent questions. And uh, I hope that the opportunity will soon come to, uh, to meet you in person and we can uh, then discuss in more depth. Exactly. And everything has been recorded, so the presentation as well from John can be learned by heart. And then you can tune your question to that one as well okay so thank you everybody and um, maybe ketavi want to have some more words mm -hmm. thank you so much. all right okay i think uh, that's the end yeah, all right. i think we're getting called to prayer Bye, John. Bye. Bye.